There we go. Uh, we want to welcome you to tonight's Mountain Zoom. Uh, we have with us uh, Chris Toich, who is with the University of Kentucky, is a, a forage specialist uh, based out of West Kentucky at, at the Princeton um, Research uh, Station, which I assume is back in some semblance of order now. And uh, so, Chris, I'll just hand it over to you. Okay. I'll give you just a, um, before I share my slides, I'll give you a quick update in the research station. So we were hit with a um, F4 tornado in uh, December of 2021, and it um, pretty much devastated the research station. We lost uh, 39. Chris, you froze up on us, if you can hear me. Can the rest of you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I know he was having an issue with uh, with the internet out there. Somebody ripped out a, a major line, so uh, he may have to go out and come back in. <clears throat> Apologize for that, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have him back momentarily. There he is. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. I'll just I'll I'll just tell everyone that I'm I'm working for my cell phone. We lost our internet connection here at the research station yesterday afternoon. So um if you can't hear me, let me know, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. Um Shad, make sure and let me know if I if we lose connection, okay? Will do. Uh, can you allow me to share my screen, Shad? Yeah, that would be helpful. Here we go. All right. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right. Everything's moving a little bit slow on my end, but but it'll be okay. So um so I'm gonna talk about um pasture renovation tonight. And and I what I want to do is kind of lead you through a, my thought process when it comes to pasture renovation and then talk about frost seeding as part of this whole pasture renovation program. So when we talk about pasture renovation, we often think of pasture renovation as reseeding, and it's not necessarily reseeding. In a lot of cases, there's a lot of other things that needs to happen during a pasture renovation project um, before we get to the actual reseeding. And sometimes we may not even need to reseed if, if we change our management and we adjust things in the soil. Oftentimes, just doing that can help to renovate that pasture. And that's kind of what I want to focus on tonight is talking a little bit about this renovation process. So what I've done is I've got about eight steps that I want to talk about tonight. And, and the first one is, is, I think, probably one of the most important set, steps that we don't often talk enough about when we talk about renovating pastures. And that's to set a sustainable stocking rate. This is a really important step because if we don't have a sustainable stocking rate, then everything else that we do is, is not going to be successful if we're overstocked. And, and I've got this little diagram here that I kind of wanted to show you. It's got two lines on it. There's a solid line that's output per unit land area, and then and there's a dotted line, which is output per individual animal. This, this diagram is called Mott's Curve. Gerald Mott was the guy that kind of came up with this outline back in the 1980s. 
And on the bottom of the graph, we have stocking rate. And as we move to the right, that's going to be increasing stocking rate. So we go from a low to a high stocking rate. And then um, on the curve, on the y-axis, we have our two curves. Hey, I'm, I'm going to step out one second and just turn off my um, heater in my office so it doesn't interfere with the sound. I'm back. It'll it'll go off in one second here. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about this curve. So we've got two lines on here. As, as we increase stocking rate, our individual AMP performance represented by the dotted line starts to go down. So in a very light stocking rate, we'll have the highest AMP performance. Now, as we increase stocking rate, our output per unit land area or the amount of beef that we're producing per acre is going to increase. And that increases. And where these two lines cross at, so we don't have optimal animal individual animal performance, um, but we have a lot more beef being produced per acre. Where these two lines cross at, that's where we want to be in terms of having the optimal stocking rate. Now, what I want you to notice is that once we get past this optimal stocking rate zone, we have neither good animal per, individual animal performance or and we do not have good output per unit land area. Both crashes. And, and that's what's so important to understand is if we have a high stocking rate, there's not a lot we can do to improve pasture productivity. So we've got to be back here in this optimal zone where these two lines cross at. And you're you're probably saying, well, what what is that? What's that stocking rate? And it's going to vary. If you have really productive soils, you might get down to as low as two acres per cow-calf unit. If you have a lot of sloping soils, a lot of um, shallow soils, then you may be pushing up to that three to four acres per cow-calf unit. So it's going to depend a little bit on where you're at in the state and also on the type of soils that you have. So the first step was getting the stocking rate right. And if we get that right, we can move on to our second step. And our second step is to step back and take a look at our, our pastures in terms of weeds in our pastures. We're always going to have some weeds, and, and that's okay to have some weeds, but we don't want our pastures to be dominated by weeds. Um, we control in a pasture is quite a bit different than we control in a row crop field. In a row crop field, we know what a weed is. Everybody know what a weed is? A weed is something that the animals won't eat in the pasture. In a row crop field, it's something that we're not trying to grow. So we can have weeds in the pasture, and if animals are grazing those weeds, then they become part of the forage system. They're what we call a kind of a weedy form. And weeds are kind of species of opportunity, and what they're looking for is an open space in that pasture. And Often we say the weed is the problem, but really the weeds are often a symptom of something else that's going wrong with our management in that pasture. Maybe we're stocked too high. Maybe our soil fertility is not good. Maybe we're not doing a great job managing grazing in that pasture. All those things can cause an open spot in that pasture. And when we have an open spot, then we give a weed a place to grow within that pasture. There, there's not going to be a lot of bare soil very long in a pasture. Usually the good Lord puts something there to hold that soil together, and normally that's a, a weed in most situations. So when we talk about weed control in pastures, you know, the first thing we always think about is, is reaching for a jug, a jug of herbicide. If we go down to the co-op and we say, I've got this weed problem, um, what do you have for it? They're going to say, well, I've got this herbicide. We've got some great herbicides for weed problems in, in pastures. Um, the problem is, is we spray that, that weed out, and then what do we have left? We, we have an open spot. What grows in an open spot? A weed. So, so it's kind of like a revolving door. When we talk about weed control in pastures, we really need to be thinking about why do we have that weed? What What is it a symptom of? 
and normally it's it's something to do with our management. So when we talk about a successful weed control program in pastures, it's it's going to be really an integrated uh, program. It's going to involve getting the soil fertility right. It's going to talk about choosing forage species that are adapted to where you're trying to grow them at. It's going to talk about um, managing grazing, and then and then we can use herbicides and we get those really tough to control weeds in the pasture that we can't control with management. The best defense against weeds in a pasture is going to be having a healthy stand of forages. We've got a really good publication in Kentucky. It's AGR 207. It's Broadleaf Weeds of Pastures. It was recently updated by Dr. Green. And it's got pictures of, of some of our most common pasture weeds. And then more importantly on the back, it's got a list of these weeds. And then it's got the list of the herbicide. But even more important than the herbicide is when to apply it. So we can have the right herbicide matched up with the right weed, but if we don't apply it at the right time, then we don't get effective control. So, so that preferred time of application is really important. So I would encourage you, if you're a producer and you have weed problems, dig up one of those weeds and take it into your extension office and work with your agent to figure out what it is. And, and then you can make a, a strategy to, to get control of that weed in your pastures. So we talked about getting the stocking rate right, and then we talked about controlling problem weeds as part of a pasture renovation program. The next thing we need to do is, is think about soil fertility in our pasture. So the third step is to get a, get a soil test of your pastures. And a soil test is gonna quantify two primary nutrients, phosphorus and potassium. It does not quantify nitrogen. Nitrogen is very mobile in the soil. Um, it provides a baseline for establishing a successful soil fertility program. Otherwise, we're just kind of guessing what goes on that pasture. And if we're just putting on triple 19 or triple 10 on that pasture, then in most cases, we'll be over applying one nutrient and under applying another nutrient. So a good soil fertility program is most important when fertilizer prices are high because it really allows us to target applications of just what that pasture needs. So if I don't need phosphorus, I can just put potash on that hay field. So um, it's important to have a good idea of what's in that, that soil. And we want to sample every two to three years um, to kind of keep up with the fertility in our pastures. Now, one of the most beautiful things about pastures is that once we get our fertility adjusted to that medium to medium plus level, um, we're not removing a lot of nutrients because the animals are recycling most of the nutrients. 80 to 90% of the nutrients that go in the front end of the animal are coming out the back end of the animal. Now, in contrast, hay fields are a little bit different, right? Because we're actually removing a significant quantity of nutrients in the hay that we remove from that field. So every ton of hay is going to have somewhere around 15 pounds of um about 40 pounds of nitrogen, somewhere around 15 pounds of phosphate or P2O5, and around 40 to 60 pounds of K2O, depending on uh, the particular field and forage crop. We've got a really nice publication on sampling hay fields and pastures, and it, it talks about things um, to avoid when you're getting a sample and, and how to get that sample correctly. Remember the results of a soil test are only going to be as good as the sample is representative of the field that you're uh, taking the sample in. So some important things to remember is that if you have areas where there's a waterer or where I fed a hay bale at or where there's a mineral feeder or a pond or shade, those areas attract to animals and where we attract the animals at, we tend to concentrate nutrients. We want to avoid those areas when we're taking the soil sample. Um, for hay fields and pastures. Okay, the, the first thing to do when I get my soil test results back is I always look at the, the pH of the soil. Um, low soil pH or acidity in the soil is still a major factor in limiting forage production in, in not just Kentucky and Tennessee, but the whole southeastern United States. Um, and it does several things. It reduces nutrient availability. So when our pH gets low 
we're going to tend to have fewer nutrients. The nutrients are going to be less plant available. It also reduces nitrogen fixation in our legumes, like uh, red clover, white clover, alfalfa, lespedezas, and so forth. So liming neutralizes that soil acidity, and it also supplies calcium and magnesium. And these are some general guidelines. I always like to say for most pastures, um, if we get up between 6 and 6.4, we're going to create an environment which is conducive to not only grass growth, but also is going to encourage legumes in our pastures. Things like red clover, white clover um, will tend to thrive in that pH range. All right, so our fourth step in this kind of thinking about this holistic renovation process is to implement rotational stocking. So uh, ideally, um, if you're not doing rotational stocking, you'll you'll consider doing it as you move forward. And I'm, I'll tell you a little bit about its benefits. So when we think about implementing rotational stocking, we need to make sure we go into it with the right attitude. Don't do it because I told you to do it or your extension agent told you to do it or your NRCS person told you to do it. Do it because you want to do it. If you go into it and you say, well, this is never going to work, chances of you being successful are going to be pretty, pretty slim. So what we're doing when we implement rotational stocking is we're getting control of grazing. So instead of the animal making the choices of where and when they're going to graze and how close they're going to graze that pasture, you, you become in charge of that. And a key component to a rotational stocking system is going to be water. So having um, access to water, whether it's surface water that's kind of managed access or uh, uh, stock water um, or stock tank or uh, ball water, but where that water is is really key in managing rotational grazing. And we've got some good programs out there with NRCS and EQIP programs to help improve watering systems and pastures. If you ha have never participated in one of those programs, this is probably one of the best ways that we can expand our watering system and improve grazing management and pastures is participating in one of those programs. Um, so once we get our water in place, what we're really managing in that pasture is two things. We're managing how close those animals are grazing and how long those pastures get rested between grazing events. And that's going to do several things for us. Number one, it's going to increase productivity in our pastures. So when we switch from a continuous to rotational stocking system, we're going to get an increase of about 30% in pasture productivity. Does that mean we should put 30% more livestock on there? Probably not. What it, what it means is, is, is that we're going to have more forage available for the livestock that we have, and that's going to reduce the number of hay feeding days that we have within our grazing system. Hay feeding is negatively correlated to profitability and ruminant livestock operations. So the more days of the year that we're feeding hay, the lower our profitability is in general. The second thing that, that we don't talk enough about in terms of rotational stocking is that we improve the drought tolerance of pastures. So it's important to remember what we do to the top of the plant impacts what's below the soil. So if my pasture is grazed down close to the soil surface most of the summer, then my root system is gonna be much smaller on that plant. And when things get dry, that plant is gonna be more susceptible to drought. So when I start to implement rotational stocking and I only graze four to five inches and I rest pastures between grazing events, then I'm going to increase the size of my root system and improve drought tolerance of that, that pasture. The other thing it does that we don't talk enough about is when we reduce the area that animals have access to, we get a more uniform distribution of dung and urine. So we tend to improve nutrient cycling within grazing systems. So the smaller we make our pastures, the more even the dung and urine are dis distributed within the pasture. We did a study last year at the research station with um, bale grazing and stockpiling. And what we did was we took 60 cow-calf pairs and we gave them access to um, six hay bales at a time in a 10-acre pasture. For, and that was enough for about two to three days. And then we moved a hot wire back and gave them six more bales, six more bales, six more bales, six more bales. And um, 
when we measured the dung distribution in those pastures after we were done, we had about 1,523 dung piles per acre. And, and I did make my students count those. Not the whole acre, but we did sample areas. Um, the last thing I want to mention as a, um, as a benefit of rotational stocking is that it's a really good tool to manage botanical composition in pastures. So what do I mean by botanical composition? I mean the the plants that are dominant in that that pasture. So is there more grass or more legume? Is there more Cerecia lespedeza or more white clover? And all that is can be impacted by how we manage those pastures. Grazing management's a powerful tool when it comes to impact not only the productivity of pastures, but also the composition of pastures. So just by how close and how frequent we can graze, we graze pastures can um, impact what plants are dominant within that stand. And that's a whole nother, a whole nother talk. Um, so the last thing I want to say about rotational stocking is that often we, we talk about it like you have to move animals every day or every two days and, and that's not true that a lot of farms can just implement a rudimentary rotational stocking system just by closing gates and when you close gates you're starting a simple rotational stocking system um, the intensity of that system is going to depend on your wants and needs if you work a public job and you want to move animals on sunday after church then then you set your system up so that it's sized to move to give animals enough forage for one week at a time. The important thing to think about when you're implementing a rotational stocking system is that when you design it, especially those watering points, make sure that you size your pipe accordingly. You want your pipeline to be sized a little bit larger than you think. And um, you wanna make sure that your water points are placed correctly so that in the future you can expand that system or intensify that management if you would like. So it's important to build that flexibility into grazing systems at, at the beginning so that as your management improves, that grazing system can improve and intensify with you. I just mentioned a nice publication we have. It's called Rotational Stocking. It's ID 143, and um, it's available at your local extension office or, or online. So step number five is we want to make sure that when we select species for pastures that we're choosing adapted species and then the best varieties of those adapted species. And we want speed forage species to be regionally adapted. I know that sounds funny that I'm even mentioning that, but I, but I see a lot of people that move in, say, from Illinois or Ohio, and along with them, they bring down their forage species. And what's adapted in Northern Illinois is not gonna be adapted in Western Kentucky or, or Eastern Kentucky. So it's important that we choose species that we know do well in that system. And that primary grass species will be tall fescue, love it or hate it. The simple fact of the matter is this weaned more calves in this part of the country than any other grass species that we have. In terms of legumes, you know, a well-adapted legume would be red and white clover. And, um, and on reclaimed mine land, we'll commonly find Cerecia lespedeza. So we can spend our, our entire life fighting Cerecia lespedeza, or we can kind of figure out how to incorporate it into a sustainable grazing system on reclaimed mine land. Um, and then we want to select the top performing varieties of, of those adapted species. It, here in Kentucky, we're fortunate to have one of the most extensive variety testing programs in the entire country. And um, and it's important you you use that data. And if, if you don't know how to access that data, I'm, I'll show you um, at the end of the slide presentation. But you can also call your extension agent and they can not only show you where that data is, but help you interpret that data to choose the best varieties for your forage system. So I know this is small, so I don't expect you to read all the numbers, but I wanted to, to show you how to use the long-term variety trial summary. And in this summary, we rate the varieties as average 
above average or below average. And the way we do that is we take the average for the trial and make it 100. If, if um, it's 100, that means it's the average for the trial. And then we rank all the varieties either above average or below average. So 107 would be 7% above average. 90 would be 10% below average. And that's what's in this last column. And I just did a couple um, uh, enlargements of some of the numbers. This particular white clover variety has is 116. So that means it's 16% above average. And the number in a parentheses shows how many trials it's been evaluated in. It shows it's been evaluated in 10 trials. So when we get three or four or five trials, then we start to feel pretty confident with that number. Now, this other variety was only evaluated in two trials, and it was 71%. So that means it's 30% lower than the average for the trial. This is a trial that I would, a variety that I would not be comfortable recommending for overseeding pastures with in our part of the country. So it's important that we use this data to make data driven decisions in terms of, of varietal selection. Okay, so, so we've got our stocking rate right. We've controlled our really bad weeds. We've soil tested and adjusted fertility. We, we implemented rotational stocking. We chose a good variety. And, and now we want to try to get that variety into the sod. And, and the first, so the step number six is to suppress that existing sod. It's hard to get something going. If I've got a really strong sod that's got no place for anything to grow, it's hard to get something started in there. So close grazing is, is really important. It does a couple of things. It suppresses the, the vigor of the existing sod. And the second thing it does is reduce plant residue. And when we reduce plant residue, we allow that seed to come in contact with the soil. And for a seed to germinate, it has to have good contact with the soil. Um, the other thing that we do is uh, by reducing the vigor of that sod is we reduce shading of the seedlings that um, are trying to get established in that pasture. The best way to do this is with hard, hard grazing prior to establishment. So the only time I'll ever tell you to really abuse a pasture is when we're getting ready to frost seed into that pasture or intercede with a no-till no drill into that pasture. And, and uh, hard grazing is the best way to do that. We can do it with clipping or hay harvest, but they're not as effective. So we have our, our sod now grazed down close and we want to get something going in it. We've got to get good soil to seed contact. That's absolutely essential for germination. And there's lots of different ways we can seed. We can use frost seeding, which we'll talk in more detail in a minute, and no-till seeding we'll talk more about. We can use minimum tillage where we disturb part of the sod um, to, to get that soil to seed contact. And, and I put livestock seeding up here, and I do not recommend this one, but everybody always asks about it. So I, I make sure and stick it up here to mentioned that it just doesn't work so well. And what livestock seeding is, is when I would mix that seed with either feed or uh, mineral supplements and allow the animals to adjust that seed and then um, put it back out through the manure and hopefully some of that seed made it through the gastrointestinal tract and it will germinate and become established. This is just not good for our part of the country and I, I would not recommend it. You're much better off to frost seed um, in terms of getting even seed distribution and producing viable seedlings. Regardless of what method you choose to use, the goal is always the same, and, and that's to get good soil to seed contact. For a seed to germinate, it's got to be in contact with the soil and produce that viable seedling. So we've got to get it in good contact with the soil. And there's a number of ways to do that, and we're going to talk about those. And the first one and probably the most economical for most pasture situations is frost seeding. Frost seeding is simply broadcasting seed on. I like to see it done in starting in early February, mid-February, when we still have enough freezing and thawing cycles. And we broadcast that seed onto the soil surface. And then those freezing and thawing cycles cause causes cracks in heaving in the soil. And that incorporates that seed into the soil. 
Um, so it's important to get it on early so we have enough of those freezing and thawing cycles. It works best with red and white clover, not so well with grasses and alfalfa. Um, so we we recommend that if you're going to try alfalfa or grasses, um, that you intercede with a no-till drill would be a, a better way to get those in contact with the soil. Preparation really begins not not right now, but but before and all those things that we talked about: soil fertility, controlling broadleaf weeds, raising the the uh, pasture down close so that we can get good soil to seed contact. So it takes a little bit of planning. So frost seeding is just not stepping out in your back porch and throwing the seed on, but really thinking about this whole renovation process leading up to the actual frost seeding of the clover seed. So just some keys for frost seeding success. You want to make sure that you get your pastures grazed close and that you reduce plant residue so that soil can get in, seed so can get in contact with the soil. You want to get it on early to ensure adequate freezing and thawing cycles. Um, reduce the amount of competition after seeding. And this is something we don't talk enough about, but we broadcast the seed on there and we've done everything right so far. And, and, and then we take the animals away and we allow that sod to start to grow in the spring. And often that sod provides too much competition for those developing seedlings for light and nutrients and water. So um, leaving the animals on, allowing the animals to graze that early spring growth down even though the, the legume seed is starting to germinate and come up, it, it's okay. They're going to nip a few seedlings off. They're going to walk on some seedlings. But if we don't control that competition in the spring, we can often cause a complete stand failure due to competition for light. Make sure and use high quality seed. So uh, this year, seed, some high quality seed is going to be in short supply. Um, especially Kenlin certified. So if you're if you're going to use medium red clover seed, make sure you use a named variety and ideally go back to the variety trial and look for one that has performed average above 100, uh, 100 or above in the trial. That's going to tell us that we're getting a pretty good quality seed. Try to avoid using medium red clover because there's no guarantee where it came from. It could come from Western Canada somewhere and it's not adapted to our region and it's going to behave almost as an annual in this in your system. So make sure you use a well-adapted variety that's been tested in Kentucky. Use the correct seeding rate, so that means calibrate seeders, often easier said than done. And we'll talk a little bit about no-till no -till drill calibration. Um, spinners, calibrating small spinner seeders on ATVs or UTVs can be very difficult. Uh, we've got a new seeder at the research station. I'm going to show you just a couple slides on that. Calibration is very easy with the new seeder. Um, and it has some, some features that we have never seen in small seeders that I'll tell you about in a minute. And then make sure you get even seed distribution. And um, that's often easier said than done. And, uh, we did some work with a, a GPS unit that we can put on an, a small ATV or small tractor. It can be moved around between um, tractors and trucks and sprayers and so forth um, that allows you to see where you've been in that pasture. And I'm going to show you um, a study that we did uh, here at the research station in Western, Western Kentucky. And this study compared uh, frost seeding with or without a GPS unit. And so what we did was we had this Raven Cruiser 2 GPS unit at the time, and we we initiated guidance with it. And then for this treatment, not high tech, but we took a bag and covered that guidance up so we couldn't see where we were driving, but it was recording our track in the pasture. So we, we drove by sight alone. So we did the same thing. We initiated guidance, but this time we allowed the operator to use the guidance on the GPS unit. And we had two different drivers um, in two years. We had uh, Connor Raymond in 2019, and then um, my newest technician, Brittany Hendricks, in um, 2021. And it's not a competition, but clearly one of these drivers did a better job than the other when it came to frost seeding pastures. So this was kind of the results. And, um, and when we looked at the overlap in 2019, 
when when Connor didn't have any guidance at all, he had 50% overlap. Let me repeat that, 50% overlap. So the tendency was not to have skips in the pasture, but to make sure we didn't miss anything. And when, when we didn't miss anything, he overlapped 50%. So just think about that in terms of how much more it costs to oversee that pasture because we had so much overlap in that pasture. Brittany did a better job, but she still had a significant amount of overlap. She had 21% overlap um, with no guidance um, in 2021. If you look at the overlap with guidance, it was reduced to three to three and a half percent just by using that GPS unit. So a significant reduction in the amount of overlap in those pastures. So the average overlap between the two operators was 35%. And this was our, our clear winner when it, it came to driving without guidance was uh, Brittany Hendricks, uh, my new technician from North Carolina. This is just a, a picture of one, one of the pastures. And we did this in four different pastures, but we can see in the top left picture where Connor kind of got lost up here in this half of the field and how close his pattern was versus when he used guidance in this particular pasture and how even um, the seed distribution was. So just looking at the economics, and, and I'm not an economist, and I, I say that, and I call it agroeconomics because that's economics done by an agronomist. And, uh, and, and sometimes I, agronomists leave things out that economists actually put in. But when we look at this, and, and what we're looking at here is the amount of overlap on the top, 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50%. And then this is the amount of acres um, that we would need to oversee to recover the cost of the system. And then this is the cost of the operations. So, so if we were spreading, uh, say, six pounds of red clover on and a pound of Ladino clover, it's probably going to cost us around $30 per acre. And if we had a 20% overlap, we could recover the cost of that GPS unit, which was around $1,500 and about 250 acres of, of frost seeding. Now, what I want you to notice is that if we do something that costs more, $70 per acre, say we're spreading fertilizer um, on the pasture and we had 20% overlap, then our cost of recovery would be even a few acres, right? Because the cost of the operation was higher. And that would be recouped in about 107 acres. The nice thing about these little GPS units is that you can use them to spread fertilizer with, you can use them to spray with, you can use them to spread seed with, you can even use them to no-till with, because sometimes it's hard to see where you've been in the pasture with a no-till drill. Um, but that guidance is, is a really nice to have for any kind of operation where you're broadcasting something in that pasture. I wanted to tell you about a, um, a study that we just did this year. My uh, two technicians, Caroline and, and Brittany, did this little study. And we used this little cedar called an, an APV. And it, it's got some unique features. I'll tell you about them in a minute. The first thing I just wanted to say was that um, when we when we frost seed in a pasture, we we have a target speed that we want to go. But as everyone that has ever been in the pasture knows, some areas of the pasture are going to be um, good for going that speed. Some are going to be too rough for that speed. Some we can go a little faster in. So the rough and undulating terrain of pastures really slows us down in some instances. And when we slow down, that can cause us to to overseed those areas of the pasture. This little cedar is, is made in Austria, um, and it's got a speed sensor on the, a GPS speed sensor that you mount on your UTV. And so when it senses your speed, when it senses that you're slowing down, it slows the seeding rate down automatically. When it senses your speed up, it speeds the seeding rate up so that you're getting an even distribution, or at least that's what the company had told us. So we did a little say to assess to assess how well this technology was working at, at compensating for 
high or low speeds in the pasture. So just a little bit about our methods. So we had three, we had um, six treatments. We had a constant seeding rate. So that means we calibrated our seeder for um, 10 pounds per acre at six miles an hour. And then we had three seed treatments, or three speed treatments, three, six, and nine miles an hour. And then our second set of treatments was a variable seeding rate um, on using the variable seeding rate option on the seeder and then varying our seeding rate from three, six, and nine miles an hour. And we put 15 pounds of seed, we weighed the seed out and put it in the seeder, and then we drove a thousand meter course, a thousand foot course, and then we, we took a shot vacuum and we swept all the remaining seed out of the seeder and weighed it. And that allowed us to calculate our actual seeding rate very accurately. So this first graph is just showing us our speed. So we have three target speeds and in, indicated by this dotted line, three miles an hour, six miles an hour, and nine miles an hour. And um, as you can see, we came, our black bar represented the three mile an hour treatments. We were very close um, to hitting our target speed. Uh, six miles an hour is our red bars, and then our green bars were uh, nine miles an hour. So we came very close to going as fast as we had um, predicted. And the way we calculated that was I had my technicians time how far, how long it took to go a thousand feet. And then we back figured that um, to figure out what their miles per hour were. So this is really kind of the, the tell all with this particular study. This slide shows, um, this half of the slide shows when we were using the variable seeding rate option. And this is three miles an hour black bar, six miles an hour uh, red bar, and the green bar is nine miles per hour. What I want you to notice is when we had the variable seeding rate option engaged on that seeder, we, we never varied very far from our 10 pounds per acre seeding rate. We were always within about 10% of that 10 pounds per acre seeding rate, even when we slowed down to three miles an hour or sped up to nine miles an hour. So the seeder, the variable seeding rate technology worked very well on that seeder. So if you look at the second half of this, this is where we had the constant seeding rate. So we calibrated that seeding rate for um, six miles an hour, 10 pounds per acre. And that's where we were at with our six mile an hour treatment, the red bar. When we slowed down to three miles per hour, we essentially doubled our seeding rate by slowing down and keeping our uh, seeding rate constant. And when we kept it constant and sped up to nine miles per hour, we reduced our seeding rate by about 33%. So our, the take home is, is this variable seeding rate thing really worked fairly well in, in this particular study. Okay, I just want to remind everybody, we've got a really good cross-seeding publication. Um, it's AGR 271. It's local available to your local extension office, or you can download it from our extension uh, website. And it goes through all the steps that we just talked about in terms of frost-seeding and pastures. It's just two pages of back and the front, so it's easy to read, and everything is uh, bulleted in terms of the most important steps that we need to take. The other feature I like of these publications, these short publications, is frost seeding at a glance. And that's just one little box that goes through the main points that you need to take away from that particular publication. I want to kind of finish things up and just talk a little bit about using no-till drills because they, they can be a very effective tool in um, interceding things into pastures. It's going to take more attention and um, effort and attention to detail, but because the no-till drill is putting that seed in contact with the soil, we generally tend to get more um, uniform results if we use the drill right. And we can successfully implement this in either the spring or the fall. So this is the best method for grasses and, and uh, alfalfa. Um, we want to suppress the sod and reduce residue just like we would for frost seeding. We want to make sure that we calibrate the drill prior to seeding. We've got a really nice um, method. It's called uh, calibrate. Uh, don't make a mistake, calibrate. We've got a 
publication on this. And the nice thing about this publication is, is that you don't have to do any math. Well, you have to do one small piece of math. And uh, you have to figure out how many times to turn the tire on the drill to make 150 uh, feet of travel. And um, you do that just by taking 150 and dividing it by the circumference of the tire. Once we figure that out, we can use this chart to calculate how much um, seed we need to catch. In this example, we have a disc opener spacing of seven and a half inches, and we want a seeding rate of 120 pounds, so we're seeding a small grain here. And this tells us when we come here that we need to catch 117 grams of seed per disc opener. Really easy. We just put a bag on there, catch the seed in a bag, weigh it. If it's not enough, we open the drill up a little bit more. If it's too much, we close it down a little bit. And we want to come to about 10%, um, within 10% of our targeted seeding rate. We've got a, a video on our um, KY Forge's YouTube channel um, on calibrating a, a drill in a stationary position using this particular method. It's about 12 or 15 minutes long. It's well worth your time to watch if you want to try to calibrate a drill. Okay, so we get our drill calibrated. The next thing we want to check is um, when we start to seed is how deep are we putting that seed. Most of our small seed of forages need to be seeded at a half an inch or less. And um, don't take somebody's word for it. Um, make sure you check your seeding depth, stop, see how deep your disc opener is going. Make sure that you can see a little bit of seed along that slit. If you can't see any seed along the slit, then you're probably going a little bit too deep. These are just some interns from, um, from several years ago, checking the seeding depth on a summer annual demonstration. We're seeding on a farm in Western Kentucky. And then the last thing is control competition after seeding. And that's kind of our last step in this process. So we've done everything right so far. We've got good soil to seed contact. We've controlled our weeds. We've got good soil fertility. The last step is, is to make sure that we control the competition from that sod until those uh, seedlings get big enough that they're able to handle uh, more competition. This often determines the success or failure of a, a pasture renovation. Seedlings just don't have the root system established or the leaf area established to tolerate a lot of competition early on. Um, what we want to do is keep the canopy open and we can keep grazing until those seedlings get tall enough that they're starting to get grazed off. And then we can take the animals out let the seedlings get a little bit taller, four to six inches tall, and then we can put the animals, put that pasture back in our rotation. We can do this with either flash grazing, that's where we're actually grazing a large number of animals across that pasture on a small area, so they take it down more uniformly, or we can clip above the seedlings. Grazing is always better than, than clipping. Um, when we clip, especially if there's a lot of biomass there, we tend to make a um, a swath of biomass, which could kill the seedlings in that swath. So I just want to finish up with my pasture renovation checklist, and that's control problem weeds, soil test and adjust fertility, implement rotational stocking, choose an adapted forage species, suppress the sod prior to, to frost seeding or no-till drilling, get, make sure you get good soil to seed contact regardless of the method that you're using, and then control post-seeding competition. This is where people often fail at is, is they do everything else right and then fail to control that post-seeding competition, which can lead to stand failure. Just want to finish up with a couple of resources. We, we've got a really good UK Forges website, um, and it's got upcoming events on it. It's got a, a Forge newsletter that you can subscribe to. It comes out religiously at the beginning of every month. We've got all of our information organized under 15 of these little tiles. So if you want to know something about alfalfa, you click here. Uh, forage species here, variety trials here. Um, so it just kind of keeps everything organized so that you can find information quickly. If you want to find this, the best way to get to is just, just Google UK forages. And, and when you do that, it will be the first thing that pops up in your search. The second resource that I wanted to make you aware of is our KY Forge's YouTube channel. 
Um, we've got about 500 different videos on here, all forage and livestock related. Um, if we do a meeting, we we record that video and we put it on here. All of our major forage conferences are recorded and put in playlist on this channel. So if you wanted to watch the grazing conference from this year, statewide grazing conference, but you didn't get a chance to come to it, just go to the playlist. All the videos from that grazing conference will be in that playlist, and you can watch them just like you're watching this presentation tonight. And that's all I have is if there's any questions, I'll be happy, happy to answer them. I'm going to unshare my screen. Very good presentation, Chris. I, I did have a question, uh, or I guess a, sure. a statement. Uh, when when we had our, um, um, I guess it was from the Windrows uh, recently, there was a whole conversation, and you hit on this a little bit tonight about the shortage of clover seed. And I, I just wanted you to, to speak to just how bad that shortage is going to be. if you're still with us. We may have lost him. One thing that, that came up in that workshop was that uh, the availability of the improved varieties of clover seed is going to be exceedingly scarce this year. And so um, there was debate about whether or not it was worthwhile to renovate uh, pastures with uh, substandard clover. Um, and I, I was hoping that Chris would, would be able to speak to that. And I, I still hope that he is. Did you catch that at all, Chris? You're muted. I can't hear you. Sorry, for some reason it kicked me off and came back, back on. So, so there, I was just saying that there's a variety uh, called Q that's out of Florida. It's out of Ken Quisenberry's program. And we, we don't have a lot of data on it. We have, this will be the first year it's in a trial in Kentucky. And we don't, we feel like it's not going to have the cold tolerance to survive here because it's out of genetics from Florida. So you have to be really careful if you select that variety. And I wouldn't put it on a large amount of acreage. Probably one of our best varieties, if you can get your hands on it, and it's very short this year, is Kenlin certified. Kenlin's an older variety, but very, very good performer um, in Kentucky. Um, but you have to make sure that you get Kenlin. If you get Kenlin, because it's a public variety, it has to be certified. It has to have that blue tag on it. If if you can't get, if you get Kenlin non-certified, it could be anything in that bag. Probably a variety stated medium red clover variety not stated and it is this a nationwide issue um the, the shortage of the clover seed yeah i think it's it's a uh, it's a, a a nationwide issue and when when that happens when we do have a short year i'm not, not sure exactly what happened in the seed production process but when we have a short year like that a lot of times they'll ship clover in from other places Sometimes it's it's fairly well adapted here, and sometimes it's not. So you just have to be careful. So I guess the the point is is that if if you're going to frost seed in the next three or four weeks, then we really need to be thinking about lining up some medium red clover. That's going to be a pretty good variety for us. Very good, you guys. Do any of you all have any questions for him or Mr. Ham? I don't have a, a question per se. It may end up in one, but I, you, Chris mentioned it. Uh, you know, you're NRCS, your district conservationist, um, and their program, their EQIP, and then their CSP. And how important those are, we're seeing are, and I'm assuming it's going to be maybe a similar situation in Kentucky and North Carolina and Virginia, but they've upped the pay rate for that CSP for approved practices. And one of the primary practices our producers are signing up for is frost seeding. Um, just in Johnson County, we have 150 people that have signed up for that program, many of which have never went through NRCS before. So we're working with them. And this is just an excellent presentation. So thank you so much for this on how to really do this and do it successfully. Thankfully, those contracts won't be signed and approved until 
this fall. So we're looking at a cross seeding dates of 2025. So we've got some time, but like just what you said, we can't just go out there right now and throw some seed out there and cross our fingers and hope it works. Even if the government is paying us to do that, we, the importance of those and having a good stand is really going to be important. Yep. So I, one, one thing I didn't mention that I, and uh, you kind of reminded me of it, um, is that, uh, you know, the question always is, is how often should we frost seed? And the general recommendation is every two to three years. Um, red clover is a short-lived perennial in most cases. And with a, with a poor variety or a variety not stated, it could be as short as a year. But with improved varieties, we'll usually get two or three years of production out of those. So the the question in, in Ray and Jimmy and I have debated this is uh, whether we should be recommending that that people frost seed more frequently, but with a lower rate of clover. So instead of say, instead of using six to eight pounds every three years, maybe we'll use four pounds and a half a pound of ladino every year. So that there's some fresh seed always present when the conditions get right, because it is an environmental thing too. Some years are better frost seeding years than other years, and I'm not sure exactly why, but but we commonly see that. Is there any other questions? In light of the program that Billy mentioned, I wonder if that itself might be playing a role in the shortage. If you suddenly have that many extra people competing for clover seed, and if that's a nationwide program, <clears throat> that might yeah, explain I'm, it. I'm not sure, to be, to be honest with you. Well, Chris, that was an excellent talk, and, and we thank you uh, for doing it. And... Um, uh, I'm assuming Jeremy, Phil, you guys good? A any questions? No questions, but but Chris, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank yep. you for talking to us tonight. My pleasure. No questions. Uh, thanks, Chris. We appreciate it, and I'll uh, I'll see you in March and uh, and you in Virginia. Yep, looking forward to it. Sounds good. Phil, what is our next talk? Do, or Jeremy or Billy? Do y'all know what the the next? Zoom is off the top of your head. You're muted, Billy. I think that's Rob's Cowboy Ethics on Monday the 5th. Does that sound correct? Uh, sure. Yeah, that's what I have. Okay, good deal. All right. Well, guys, thank you all for tuning in, and uh, uh, Chris, thank you very much. Uh, hope everything's great in West Kentucky, and um, we'll plan to see you all at the next one for Cowboy Ethics. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a good night. You too. You too.